Hello and welcome to Beyond Boundaries. I'm Justin Douglas. So happy you can join me for this episode of Beyond Boundaries. Please consider checking out the Patreon page and supporting the Beyond Boundaries podcast if you're able. That's patreon.com forward slash Beyond Boundaries podcast. You can also help by sharing, subscribing, rating, and reviewing the podcast. It makes a huge difference. Hope you enjoy this episode of Beyond Boundaries. Alrighty, I'm here with Doran Gingrich, right? Gingrich? Yes. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Yes. Just wanted Gingrich. to make sure I got it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and Doran and I have been friends for, what, a couple years now? I guess. I guess, yeah. We <laughs> met at like a young adults conference that I was speaking at, and then uh, I did like a breakout session. We spoke about LGBT issues, and I had just become a forming, so I wanted to attend, but I didn't know what kind of pastor you were at that point, <laughs> so I didn't say much of anything. Yeah, yeah. And then I think we connected maybe after that breakout, because it was like more of a breakout session, right? It was right. more based, right. it was more like me facilitating a discussion about that. Yeah, and I just said, I'm gay, and that's it. And I didn't talk to anyone else in that whole group because I just did not know if it was safe or not. Sure, yeah. sure. And um, and from there, uh, maybe we got coffee after that or something. We might have yeah. exchanged contacts and then got coffee after that. Just shared a bit about my life story and you shared some about you. I don't think you were completely affirming at I that time, but no. you were more um, accepting. Yeah, and I was kind of exploring right. my theology, I think, at that point too. Um, and then our, uh, our church had kind of a time where we took some of our leaders and, and, and shared some stories of some people within our community and even some people outside of our community. And, um, and I asked you to attend that and share a little bit of your experience and story, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, how was that? How did you like that? Oh, it was nerve wracking. Yeah. But like, I felt like I spoke well and I shared some important information. Um, From there, we stayed connected. One thing I think is amazing, you gave me some books to oh, read. I gave, gave you a, a list of podcasts and books that helped me on my journey. Yeah. To accept myself or just stuff you could recommend to people as well. Yeah. 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 And that was super helpful, including you wrote out your whole story. Like... Mm. A, a good did, amount I of never heard if you actually read it all, so I oh, just kind of assumed. I did. Know. I read it all. Oh, yeah, okay. Allie and I both read it all. Oh, yeah, 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 great. yeah. And it was just, um, it was really helpful on on my journey to to have a connection with Doran. And so today, my goal is that you might have a connection with Doran as he's going to kind of share some of his story, um, probably starting with uh, uh, a little bit about him as an individual right now, and then maybe we can go back. And so for okay. the listeners listening. Uh, obviously they're, they're going to need to, to, to listen to you intently. So maybe share a little bit about, um, uh, uh yourself sure. and then, and then we can get into the history. Uh, a few years ago, I got, I, well, I knew I had a disease for a while, but it did not affect my whole body until a few years ago where it started to progress. And currently it really affects my tongue and mm-hmm. sometimes my vocal cords where I just sound really unique or sure. hard to understand sometimes. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. probably, if you're struggling, I apologize. Well, but, I think they'll, I think they'll be able to, yeah. to hear fine, but, um, all right, Doran, why don't you take a moment to kind of unpack your story? And I know you kind of have a framework and a way of presenting your story. What I'll kind of do is just maybe bounce in with questions here and there if I have clarifying questions, but I'll let you kind of go and and share a little bit of your experience, your story, and and how it's unique. Sure. Um, I was raised in a conservative Mennonite home. Um, Like, our church in particular was very, I don't know, I would say uh, healthy in some ways and unhealthy in others. Sure. Like, we were taught to be very suspicious of the world and of things in general. Um, Like, anything popular seemed to be a no-no. Like, Pokemon, Harry Potter, um, 
Yeah, it's all seemed to have some some issue or problem with it that was not acceptable. Um, like and even little stupid stuff like commercials. Do you remember? Do you remember that commercial? Just do it by Nike. Yeah. My uh, my mom would sometimes be like, "Oh, that's terrible." I'm like, "Why is that terrible?" <laughs> They're talking about sex. I'm like, and it's just like bizarre how like everything can be mis misconstrued or just had the worst thing projected onto something that was completely sure. innocent. Sure. So would you say you were you were raised in a pretty like black and white worldview? Like it's either right or it's wrong. There's no kind of gray. There's no kind of ambiguity. I, I remember in a church service we had like a black and white graph and in the middle is gray. And like our pastor would put some things in the gray category, like Christian rock. It was in the gray category. It's like okay. and it, he said something to the effect, like, and if it can even be mis- misconstrued as black, why would you want to entertain that at all? Sure. So it's just like the word view is just very suspicious sure. of everything. Okay. So that's the context for you being raised right. in a small town in Indiana growing up, right? right? Um, I started school, and it became immediately apparent to the people who were teaching me that I had uh, something wrong with me. Like, I I had a hard time learning or just processing information, Um, so much so that I was held back in kindergarten and had to take it again with a new class. And, yeah, I just remember being really... Always being confused and not completely understanding anything that's going on. Like I, I know I'm. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how to get into that anymore. It was just really hard. I'd, sure. Like I'd be constantly be pulled aside to to read like a Jack and Jill book over and over again, and like they were just not that well equipped to know how to teach me that well. Sure. Um, Was there not as much probably access, I would say, to like, to some of like, now we have, I think, a little more in some of the school districts, like, options for different, differently abled people. small, very, very, very small private school. Okay. And they were not equipped for me at that point. Sure, sure. So I think in the third grade, I was pulled out of that school and taken to another school that had a better program for people with learning disabilities. Yeah. And um, but that turned out to be the rival school, the school I was attending. Oh, okay. So that kind of made me an other to some people. Like, yeah. I know growing up, um, I would hear comments about the school I was attending all the time. Like, uh, they cheat. Like they, so the one school really had a problem with my school because they always seemed to beat them at basketball sure i mean occasionally that sounds terrible but occasionally they would win <laughs> i really could care less but, yeah. but they really there were there were rivalries they were rivalries. Yeah, you have rivalries. some rivalries yeah, are it. good some rivalries are unhealthy yep um when so when someone actually asked me what school did you go to before i would tell them i expected to get like an answer like <gasps> We hit them. Yeah. They could kill us. They had no idea who these people were or yeah. what the school was. It was just so one-sided. Sure. Did um, you get othered a little bit because of the school you were going to? Is that what you're kind of saying? Like, like, yeah. I like. I remember comments here and there at church because I still like the church I went to. Most of the students who went to that to that previous school went to that church. I got you. So I got othered in some ways, and then my own. Family, in some ways, othered me, like, yeah, just a huge, inconvenient rivalry. Sure. And um, and you were kind of stuck in the middle of it because you didn't really care one way or the other. You're just trying to get access to the tools you need. I mean, I was struggling a lot, too. Like, yeah. being taken out of a, a very conservative school and taken to a, a Baptist school with a whirlwind of, like, uh, like... <laughs> Things that were issues were no longer issues at this school. So it's just like it opened me up to new ideas and thoughts. Like sure. 
the new Star Wars movie, uh, The Phantom Menace, was coming out, and yeah. like all the kids were into it, and I had no concept of what Star Wars even was at that point. Really? And they, well, I wasn't allowed to watch yeah. it because it's war and it's bad. So I just had no concept of it, and I felt other than there because like they just didn't know what to make to make of me. I was actually called sure. Amish for quite a while. You're called I, Amish? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they saw my mom with a covering and just were like, are you Amish? And they yeah. had to explain, no, I'm not Amish. I'm just in the night. And they just didn't understand. So they didn't, yeah, because if you're going to a Baptist school, they don't have a, they don't have the spectrum of like Amish Mennonite right. head covering right. to typical Baptist, you know, no elementary kid is, yeah. is like, they don't know the difference. Yeah. And that, like, I was learning quite a bit. It was really hard, though. Like, I did not realize how far behind I had fallen. Okay. Like, when I first started there in third grade, um, the, the, my one special ed teacher said, we just had to start over with you, to, like, completely with the alphabet, because you were so, we didn't know where you were. We just started all over with you. Okay. And so it's just, my parents said, we just assumed you'd be there for one year, you'd catch up, and we'd take it back. Mm. And that did not happen. I had mm. to continually catch up until, mm. well, we shouldn't go that far ahead. Um, around this time, I was figuring out that I was also gay. Mm -hmm. And I just, just completely freaked out by that. So when you say you were figuring out that you were gay and you were in third grade, now you had been held back a year, so what, you were nine? Um... I really couldn't tell you okay. for all certainty. But do you think like eight, nine, ten? That range is where you're Around starting then, to. Yeah. Like, and when you're start, when you're saying like you're starting to figure out you're gay, what is that? Like See, walk us through that a little bit because that's. I didn't really know what, what it was. I just knew I wanted to be around certain people, or I was really intrigued by certain people. Mm -hmm. Um. And yeah, it's just nothing like explicit. I was yeah. just really curious and I sure. didn't understand yeah I just didn't understand what was happening yeah and did it feel did it feel to you like something you had to keep to yourself at that point absolutely yeah like so going to another school I I think they recommended my parents that I should go to counseling just so I can process that so mm -hmm. I was being sent to a counselor at that time and I knew, I knew even then, do not talk to this guy about this or he'll tell your parents. Oh, okay. Like, I think before then, I think I saw a Dateline news yeah, program where sure. they were talking about gay marriage. And sure. I remember being so innocent and thinking, oh, God of love, he would, he would like this. And I, I, remember I brought it up to my mom later on, and she's like, no, that's not right. Oh, okay. And I didn't, like equated with me at that point but i knew it was not a good thing yeah yeah interesting so so you're processing that as an eight to ten year old while you're in elementary school at a baptist school coming from a mennonite background there's a lot of moving parts there yes and yeah. you probably don't you don't even, you can't even be really you can't even be open with your counselor about all that you're processing yeah, and, that and you're even like guarded in that relationship yeah. to you. I think we forget how smart we are as kids. Like I yeah. knew enough not to tell people yeah. the thing about me. And yeah, it's just really I don't know. A terrible situation to be in. Sure. So what was the next kind of chapter of that? So you what did like was that kind of your most of your elementary school existence and then you went into junior high or was there a catalyst moment that happened in elementary school toward the end? Um, hmm. I don't know. I think a lot of it was just me struggling with hating myself for mm. being, for having this learning disability. And mm. just, I would struggle every day at school, like feeling as an other, because you'd be mm. sent to this other classroom. And like, no one would like would talk to you about it. And I just, I felt othered in that way. And I felt othered for being closet gay. I mean, I didn't quite know if I was at that point, yeah. but I had suspicions. Sure. Um, so you felt othered because of your disability in the sense of like probably feeling like 
inadequate. You can't, yeah, you can't compete. I'd never work. felt smart. I yeah. would always tell myself how stupid I was. Mm. I never felt confident in my abilities. Mm. Um, so around ninth grade, okay, I remember being very like, I didn't know how to word this. Ninth, around ninth grade, I was sent back to my previous school. Okay. And so you went, you, you graduated junior high at the Baptist school and then you in ninth grade, uh, went back to the Mennonite school then? Um, it wasn't about graduating. It was okay. just about. You transitioned from eighth grade to ninth I, grade. I wanted to make there. my parents happy. I see. Okay. And I wanted to have them, I wanted to be proud, proud sure. of me. And I knew this, this other school was just really expensive Okay. I had learned a lot, and they were kind of getting fed up with sure. me being there because I was learning. Well, okay, I kept like running into other theology questions sure. that I would ask, and I didn't know how to answer because, like, everyone it's like women who'd cut their hair. I'm like, why are they allowed to cut their hair? And we, women in our community, can't do that. Like, okay, and they would explain the best they could, but like nothing made sense. Like, it's just yeah. I didn't quite understand all these rules that seem to be more rooted in tradition rather than in scripture. Yeah. Um, so that led to your transition in ninth grade back to the high school that, or back to the school that I, you were. I just wanted to make my parents happy. Yeah. And I had a really hard time at school. Like the the standards at this Elkhart school were really really high. Yeah. And um, I was having a lot of stress. Like it became really really difficult to continue to do my homework there. So I moved on to the other school, and I had a whirlwind of, like, oh, I, I don't know how to word this. I felt like this was a whole new world to me because I had been going to a school where I wasn't necessarily popular, but I knew people, and I knew how to interact with people in a different way. At at the other school, there seemed to be a lot of segregation between the boys and the girls. Mm. And I, I don't know for what reason, but that really seemed to irk me. I was always bringing up how stupid this is, like, <laughs> like, and it wasn't even like I wanted to date any of the girls. I just thought, like, why are we behaving like? We're kids. Like, this is just so dumb. Yeah. This does not have to be awkward. I don't know. Because you're in high school at that time. High school. And I, are you coming? And it's like a world where you're suspicious again of everything. Like, yeah. And I had such a hard time getting back into that. Mindset. Yeah, because you've been in a more, would you say you were in a more open environment at the Baptist school? I mean, and now you've I, gone back. I mean, it's hard to, I mean, obviously there's scales. There. I mean, Baptists aren't necessarily progressive. Yeah. But they were, they seem to be more progressive than what I was used to. Sure, sure. The so, com- yeah, that makes sense. So, so in ninth grade, are you further along in processing your no, sexuality? I'm, or? I'm just as self hating as I was before. Um, self hating, okay. But have you, have you come like between, between, you know, being nine or 10, now you're probably 14 ish? So, have you, have you, have you, not not necessarily processed and accepted your sexuality, but are are there is there more evidence for it? I guess is what I'm I, trying to figure out. That you're starting to say yeah, this is real. I, I knew I was gay at that point. When um, when do you think that happened? That you knew you were gay, not that you, you felt like you had like maybe feelings toward other, you know. You you know it before you could even accept it. Okay. Like the first time I actually spoke the words aloud, like and actually like examined myself, I was at this conservative camp. Okay. I'm um, held by my church. And I was like, oh, I'm gay. And I was just like, God, why this on top of everything else? Like, I knew in that moment I was gay and I didn't know what to do with it. Mm. And how old do you think you were then? Hmm. End of junior high ish? Was it like a junior high kid? Yeah, I think it was like junior high. Okay. Wow. And what, what was your response to that? Was your response like to go to the altar and repent? No. Or what was your, well, what was your my response? response was to hide. Hide it, yeah. To not think about it, to not examine it. Just don't. 
I'll take care of this later. Yeah. And it was around high school when I made a plan to actually save up money when I'm out of school, not tell anyone, save up money, and go into a conversion therapy program. Oh, hold on, hold on. So you saved up your own money. No, no, no. So This is just like a childish whim before yeah. I even knew how expensive these programs <laughs> were. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this fixed. I'm going to save up money after I'm out of high school, and then I'm going to go away and get fixed. Okay. But then, had you heard about conversion therapy before this? Yeah, that my, seems church, like... my church had been preaching about it at one point, and I thought, okay, that could be something. Maybe. So your church had shared at some point about conversion therapy. And just to like, give people maybe who aren't familiar with uh, LGBT issues or especially LGBT issues within the church, um, conversion therapy would be the idea that you go and you get some sort of intensive counseling or mm-hmm. practice that uh, eventually leads to you no longer being gay. Right. I mean, that's the idea right. of conversion therapy, that you would be converted to either um, to either celibacy or to you marrying a woman or, or you marrying a woman. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, what's uh, Boy Erased is like a, one of the one movie right. that examines mm-hmm. um, conversion therapy that I watched that was pretty, pretty awful. Mm-hmm. And from what I understand in talking to some people who have been in conversion therapy, that's a. It's not an it's not an inaccurate representation right. of some of the practices that that would be used. But I I will say by that by the time of my senior year, there was a lot of a lot of articles being written, and at that point, I kind of knew it wasn't going to happen. When but you say it wasn't going to happen, do you mean like it wasn't going to happen? Like I, you didn't like, want to do it anymore? No, or like, I knew from the articles I was reading that it wasn't working. People were like saying I lied the whole time. Like okay. a lot of people were like confessing that it was not working for them. It was all false like mm. thing. So I kind of was like, well, I don't know what to do with that. Mm. I guess I'll just marry a woman on my own and deal with it on my own. If that oh, makes okay. Sense. Okay. But um, that, so that was like fair school. I was thinking, oh, I'll just go into conversion therapy. Then I learned that it wasn't really working for people. It took a long time for that to finally like, close down some programs so that to actually work. So really quick, from from yeah. we're talking from fourteen to eighteen, maybe fifteen to nineteen, your high school life. Um, you're thinking about going into conversion therapy, like you're you're thinking about checking yourself in. Usually, that's something that's like impressed upon by parents, but you're tra- you're you're proactively trying to fix this part of you from a young age, right? Like, yeah, like it, this is- and it went beyond that too. I actually did go to one of my pastors and I confessed to him that I think I had homosexual feelings. Okay. And um how old were you at this point? You think in high school somewhere? I think I was like seventeen. Okay. Um I went to our youth pastor, and I said, I think I had homosexual feelings. He's like, okay, well, we can pray over this. And, like, I think, like, a week later, I came into the church. No one was there, just me, him, and another associate pastor. Okay. And we did some healing prayers or something. Okay. And, um, yeah, I not much to report there. It obviously did not work. Yeah. But it was just like I was trying to take care of this in how the best way I knew how to. But you hadn't told your parents yet at that point, no. right? And or any actually, family members? Yeah, or? actually, I, I realized, oh, this could have gone so terribly now because I've I read so many stories from when pastors find out, they immediately tell the parents. And I'm so thankful that this pastor didn't, like, they yeah. could have easily sent me away or, yeah, I'm not sure what would have happened, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you graduate high school. Let's flash forward to when you graduate high school. What, well, what, technically, or, I didn't you graduate didn't, okay. high school. Okay. Um, the school I went to, they had a hard time with me in, in classes. I was not like misbehaving. It was just like I had a hard time learning. Sure. And at one point, they recommended I, I drop a class, which meant I would not be graduating with a uh, proper certificate to go to college and okay. that was I cannot describe how devastating that was to me because I kept thinking like at least I'm going through all this agony and pain and feeling stupid at least I'm going to get at least I'm going to graduate yeah and I 
That was so painful to me. I cannot even describe how much hurt I had over that. And I, I remember thinking, like, what a disappointment I must be to my parents. Like, I truly wanted to make my parents proud. I wanted to mm. make them happy. And I just saw this as another, another defeat. They paid all this money into the school, and I failed them. And mm. it's so discouraging. And... Yeah, but I need to clarify. I I used to blame the school quite a bit, and I, I I've come to a place where I can I can't do that. Hmm. This was a school that was not prepared. Well, no, okay, not uh, ugh, that sounds terrible. I mean, no. this was a school that was not built for me. Sure, it was not. They didn't have the they didn't have the tools in their toolbox. Yeah, and to to they were not built for like a learning disabled kid. They tried their best. And it just didn't work out. And okay. oh, I I really want this to sound great. Like I want to be gracious. Like I'm. Yes, I think you are. I think you're being very gracious. I. They were not. I was I was not the intended student of the school, and I can't really blame them for sure. that. So sure. So, so when you left the school there, what was the next step for you? Well, as you I, entered into adulthood, I would assume I really wanted to go to college, and that was no longer realistic. Even if I would have graduated, it would not have been realistic because I was struggling in school big time. So mm-hmm. I did mission work. Um, okay, I really had a heart for missions, and I wanted to please God and mm-hmm. show my devotion. So I did an eight month long mission trip to Guatemala with a team. Okay. Um, what did you do while you were there? We worked at this um, Ketchi school. Uh, Ketchi is like an indigenous group in okay. Guatemala. Okay. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a time of real growth for me. Like, I think when you have to back away from everything you were or back away from your life in general, you are just confronted with how ugly you can be. Mm. Like you're constantly being bombarded with challenging situations. And it becomes very clear how selfish you can be. Yeah. And I had to really examine myself and learn how to grow up and mature. Yeah, sometimes the way I say that is a change of scenery can sometimes help us see ourselves differently. Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. From through a different lens or something. Yeah. Yeah. Was, so you were processing that while in Guatemala, like right. seeing yourself differently? Yes. And it was also the first time I met another gay Christian. Um, I had a teammate who's also a gay Christian, but I had not, he came out to the, to everyone in the in the training session, he came out to everyone. Okay, really quick. How yeah. how many people are on this trip? I think like five people are on this trip. Hold on. So there's five people on the trip, and one of them happens to be also a gay Christian. Right. That's pretty wild. And that must have been crazy in your head. Like when the that most happened, you were bizarre like, thing was that when, uh, as he said it, I was like, "This is why I'm on this team." But I completely squandered that situation. Okay. I was not I was not ready or I was not prepared to address my own sexuality at that time. So I never said anything to him. We could have bonded so much or like learned from each other. At that time, he was not approving either. Okay. So I'm not sure how much we would have really helped each other, but um. But it would have been good to for him to. Like for you both to ha- potentially have right. each I mean, other's experiences. He, so yeah. he, he suspected, and I told him I suspected before he actually came out. Okay. But yeah, it was just really bizarre how you, how that happened. Yeah. I, later on on the trip, um, I did come out to him, and I just cried and cried and cried. Mm. Like I wanted, I did not know how to address this at all. And after I. I came out to him. We did not talk about it for like four years after that. Oh, wow. It was just this huge thing of shame and guilt, and I just didn't know what to do with it. Do you guys still talk today? Yeah, he thought she was a really good friend. We see each other almost weekly. Oh, really? Yeah. Awesome. So, um, 
You go to Guatemala for eight months. Eight months. And then I knew, so from that experience, I learned that I'm not good with languages at all. So I... um. Was your speech affected at all at that point? No. Or okay, so I should clarify, at this point, I'm completely normal. Okay. My speech is normal. I had no issues at all, except my arm would curl sometimes when I would hold something. Okay. But, yeah. Okay, okay. So after I did the mission work, I did volunteer work in Harrisburg, PA, where, we, where I was originally trained how to be a missionary. So I joined the staff there. And okay. just try to be a blessing to other people. Okay. And is this the first time you've moved to central Pennsylvania at this point then? Yeah. Um, everyone kind of suspected I'd come back to Indiana after the mm-hmm. but I'm like, no, I got a taste of freedom. And I met people <laughs> who, who were not as, yeah, I just met a lot of different people. Sure. Like, Black and white was being challenged. You were seeing Black different, and white was being challenged. different ways. Of um, like, so you, you know, musicals are, are usually more of a girly thing for some people. Yeah, musicals are a girly thing. Well, sure. okay, back in my hometown, that's what they're associated with. <laughs> I um, understand. So when I told someone at the, at the training facility that I loved Moulin Rouge, I suspect, I was expecting like a, oh, that's such a girl movie, or I haven't even heard of it, or whatever. But this yeah. like, yeah, I really loved it too. And I was so shocked that this man could confess that he liked a musical. <laughs> sure. It's, yeah, and like, it's such a different environment. Like, yeah. I, I've met people who are like, uh, Lancaster and Harrisburg are just such conservative areas, but compared to where I came from, they're very liberal. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you're in Harrisburg. What kind of work are you doing? You I was doing community outreach coordination. Okay. Um, I would not say it'd be my first choice in, like, in a job, but it was definitely one that stretched and grew me as a person. I had to learn how to coordinate with different organizations, work with different people, groups, and Current things, yeah, it was definitely challenging, but it was a good challenge. That's awesome. That's awesome. How long did you do that? I think it was like two and a half years, maybe. Oh, wow. And then you're on staff working with the participants, and you'd be speaking into the lives. I think it's such a time of the growth. I could see how I had things to contribute to Christendom, and mm-hmm. yeah, it was just. I felt like I was doing God's work, and I felt so good. Like, I really felt like I was contributing something That's to awesome. God. So for those two, two and a half years, are you continuing to process your sexuality in the church and where that fits? Are you attending church? So How's, I was what's happening just, there? The sense is terrible, but I was like, I was looking for, like, a wife. If okay. That sense. I kept, like, thinking, who... I don't know, who could be a future Mrs. Gingrich? And I think at one point, I tricked myself into liking this girl. But I did not know what love was. And years later, talking with someone, um, they were like, yeah, I have that same issue when I was, like, struggling with my sexuality. Like, now looking back, I realized, oh, I just really liked to be with that person, but it was never, like... Romantic or anything like sure, and if it ever like I kept like thinking like could I ask this person out, and um, I, I should clarify after they were off of like out of the program I would like think should I ask this person out but I kept like saying why would you, how could you do that to them mm. like you're gay you know the statistics it usually doesn't outwork out in the end mm. if you truly loved this person. You wouldn't do that to them. So I just kept, like, hitting walls with people. And I remember at one point, I thought how nice it would be to tell, tell my family about this person, not because I truly liked them, but because I wanted them to see me as a, a man. Oh, wow, okay. 
And I thought, that is just so unfair to her. Like, mm. And I could recognize that even at that point. Mm. And at this point, your family doesn't know anything about your sexuality? Um, there's definitely been suspicions. Oh, there's been suspicions, okay. Um, Dad, of course, in school had caught, had found um, internet history. Okay. And addressed that with me several times, like... And at one point, he um, confronted me about it, really forced to be like, this is evil, like, this is not good. Are you gay? And I, I, I of course, I would lie. I'm like, no, I'm just like, trying to figure, figure it out. Like, I don't know yeah. what it is. And, and then at one point, Mom asked me point blank at Christmas, like, are you gay? How old were you at this point? Like, you're coming back for Christmas? Maybe? Yeah, I was in... I spoke at that point. Um, 21, maybe. Okay. Uh, like, are you gay? And I, like, completely lied. No, I'm not gay. How could you think that? Ha, 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 ha. Like, I, I laughed it off. Like, crazy sure. mom. Yeah. yeah. I'm not gay. And ugh, it was just a lot of stress. Yeah. I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. So at this point, you're not out to anybody except that pastor that had talked to you and this one friend that you had met at um, I think that's right yeah. at the uh, Guatemala trip that you were on. So you've gone 20 some years of your life, probably what 21 ish, 22 mm-hmm. ish. Yeah, I don't know. and you've only really told a couple people this. And it was never like it was never this freeing experience to like no. tell them. It's like here's my shame. Help me deal with it. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. So what happens next? What's the, I guess, um, next chapter in your story? So after that, I wanted to move on and actually get out into the world. I decided to move into Harrisburg and do just work there and live life. I thought I'd be close to the, the center. I'd, I'd still be involved there somehow. Yeah. But... So I got a job. It was a very stressful job. I had a, I was like a cook at a hospital, and it was not like a healthy environment. I had like four of the, the employees come up to me and like, you should not work here. It's terrible. You're too nice to work here. Don't, <laughs> don't work here. It's always great. And I had such a hard time finding this job to begin with, that, so I just stuck it out. Yeah. I, I mean, I was applying to places to get out of there, but it was just, Nothing was happening. Um, the stress was just so much. And if you know anything about my... So I should clarify, my disease is called dystonia. Okay, and dystonia. Dystonia okay. is um, a movement disorder that causes uncontrollable controllable movements. The brain sends too many signals to different parts of your body. And okay. um, you can't do anything to stop it. It's just constant movement, constant pressure, constant clenching. It's sure. Very exhausting. What the real trigger was, though, the job doesn't help trigger this, but my brother was being ordained as a pastor when I went out to see him be ordained at this other church. And I'm... Um, I remember being in the audience and seeing a kid and for the first time realizing, oh, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to have family. And this caused so much, I don't know, it just broke me. And I realized, Mm. this is never going to happen for me. I'm never going to find anyone. And that really, like, triggered the dystonia. I, I mean, like, Within like a week or two after that, I started noticing a lot more tremors mm. in my neck. Like it was not that, it was not that um, violent at that point. It was just like really subtle. And um, yeah. as time went on, it just got really, really bad. Mm. And so, so dystonia is somewhat stress induced. Is that what stress can be a huge trigger? It's, okay. My type of dystonia is, um, I think, genetic. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's just it kind of awoken. I had already had it in my arm. My arm had been curled. Like, whenever I'd write something, my hand would clench and curl. 
Okay. And I kind of learned how to adapt to that. Yeah. But um, but now it's starting to affect your speech then at this point? or Yeah, it, it more affected my back and my, my speech came a bit later. Okay. But um, life just became really hard and difficult. I did not want to quit my job. I wanted to be responsible and find some way to live with it. My doctor was giving me like 16 pills a day to try mm. to help weaken my muscles, and that did not work. I was I felt so miserable all the time. I was so tired. I was going to say, muscle relaxers are going to make you really tired. Oh, yeah. yeah. So tired. And, um, and you're also dealing with the emotional reality of yeah, like, like this. What this am I new, doing with this? Yeah. Like, why is God punishing me with this? Like, I thought I had done everything mm. I needed to do. And, like, I had not done anything. I had not, like, dated or, like, held hands with the boy. I had not embraced anything with my gayness. I, I should mention that my church never taught, but they implied sometimes you can be, you can be ill because God's punishing you. So I had, like, internalized that in some ways. I kept, like, wondering, like, why am I having mm. this? Like, I had not done anything wrong. Like, and the So for you, your disability might have been attached to some form of God's judgment on I, you? I knew it was not true, but I, I, it's hard for me to believe it. I got you. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. I, like mentally, I knew that's not God. But, like, in my... In my heart, and like God's punishing me, mm. and it took so long to work through that. I bet. I remember waking up at one point, just waking up, and immediately starting to cry and bawl mm. because I knew I had to go shopping that day, and I knew it'd be so painful to be out in public. Like mm. it, it hurt to walk. I'd just be hunched over, pulsating all day. It's mm. constantly humiliating. Mm. Um. Yeah, and it's, it's so hard, and I didn't know what to do with it. What you said when you were when you were watching your brother get ordained reminds me a little bit of like I want to say it's Matthew Vines who said like lifelong celibacy for some it hits them as like lifelong loneliness. Is that yeah. what you were feeling at that moment? Like yeah. a, a a feeling of like for my whole life I'm going to be lonely. I'm not going to have a family. I'm and not going to have kids. There's no hope of the ending. You just yeah. have to live out your whole life alone, and I. I did not desire that. I, if God wanted me to be that, to do that, okay. But I need, I need some sort of like reassurance or like, yeah. yeah. So I'm not quite sure how to move on from that. Yeah. So um, so so really quick though, in your experiences, you've met other LGBT Christians. Have you found that most of them have had that experience of like a loneliness attached to? seeing, I guess, heteronormative relationships and families and such and feeling like I may never have that? Is that something you've, a story you've heard over and over again? I, it depends on the, the type of Christian they are. Sure. Um, like the background they come from. Yeah, I think so. Like it's really been drilled into them. Mm -hmm. Then there's just like this constant depression and like no hope of mm -hmm. ever... There's no way out. I, yeah. I'm so, not. so obviously, where you're at today is a different place. So, between then and now, what's transpired that? Um, therapy. Okay. I. Well, I should clarify. So, after my illness became worse and worse, I I went home. They, my parents, found this faith healer. That I, a faith healer, really? Um, okay. And I was kind of suspicious. I didn't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. So um, I asked lots of questions, and I felt like, okay, I think this guy's somewhat legit, and I'm not going to say no to God. Healing me if he wants to, but I sent everyone out of the room, and even, like, this is what I can't fathom right now, even with all that pain, physical pain I was experiencing, I, I said to this healer, can you please pray that God would make me not gay instead of healing my disability? Oh, wow. Because I just couldn't imagine being gay hmm. and 
Like, I so wanted to be straight. I wanted to please people. I wanted to please my parents. I wanted that that life, that Christian normal life. Yeah. So you ha- you're in a room with a faith healer, and your parents are there. No, I or, I told everyone. Yeah, to but you t- that's what I'm saying. So so whoever's there, just the faith healer. And me. The faith healer. No, but I mean before that, your parents are in the room. Other family members are in the room. Like uh, is it just parents. Just your parents, but you're like parents. You need to leave. Yeah, I want to be here alone with the faith healer yeah. <laughs> because you want. Yeah, and you come out to the faith healer. Yeah. What was his response when you did that? He, I'm just curious. Like. Another moment when I could have gone terribly wrong, he could have told everyone, but he didn't. Um, he, wow. He was like, okay, yeah, I can pay for that. And he, of course, paid for all of it to go away. Yeah. And I don't know, like, how do you, how, when, it obviously it doesn't work, because you can, like, tell it immediately if it works. I'm, I'm pulsing this whole time, like, I'm constantly moving and just yeah. exhausted. And it didn't work. I'm like, well... What do I do now? Like, mm. now, do your parents come from the tradition where it's like you didn't have enough faith, and that's why you weren't healed? Or, I mean, that's more of a Pentecostal they, uh, perspective. But I don't know I what's don't, within. I don't think so. But I think they know people who do think that way. Okay. No. So did they? This faith healer wasn't necessarily from the Mennonite tradition. It was not from their church. They just like they're probably processing this themselves, trying to trying yeah. to uh, out of love for you, trying to help find some relief for you. I would assume, right? Like, um. Yeah, I think... Are they searching for answers beyond their own denomination is what I, I guess I'm saying. Is that kind of what's happening? Yeah, they have yeah. someone from that the denomination. I think okay. I think um, another family member had been really pushing them to like, see the story. Okay, okay. And so that obviously doesn't work on either mm-hmm. front. No. And um, so I started to see a therapist and just really kind of process my new normal. I had yeah. a really hard time expressing anger. Towards, mm. towards, towards this because I had been taught that you are the clay. You have no right to be angry with the potter for your situation. Yeah. And that is not a realistic attitude towards humanity. We need to express anger in healthy ways. Like, yeah. I needed to be told it's okay to be angry and to mourn the mm. life I wanted. I... I remember feeling so much pressure to be that perfect disabled Christian that they talk about in church. Mm. Like the only time disabled people are talked about in church is either when they're being healed or when they're they're a prop Mm. for normal people to feel more grateful for their lives. Like if if they can be happy, so can you. So I felt so much pressure to... To be that happy Christian. So I had a really hard time expressing my disappointment, my anger. Yeah, it's, just, it's way too much pressure. Did you go to therapy because someone said this would be a good idea? I knew Did I you? had to. I was having a lot of trouble. I was okay. very suicidal. I mm. So the depression of... Being disabled. Being, being disabled gay. and being gay had led you to... Even suicidal thoughts at that point? Absolutely. I was, I was lost to seeing my pastor at my church. He was a lot more understanding. He was not approving at all, but he was a lot more understanding. And um, I remember like telling him, like, it would be so much better if I commit suicide than to have my parents live with the shame of having a gay kid. Hmm. Like, I remember like trying to convince him, like, it's so obvious, like, I'm crying, like, but in the long run, it'd be the best thing, like, wow. and he's, he's like, no, no, it would not be the best thing, and, like, he was very mature about it, he, I think I really scared him, to be honest, because... That is scary, when that, I've, I've, I've been in that situation before, it's very scary. I think I had, like, confessed this at the end of our session, he kept me for like another half hour just to try to calm me down. Yeah. And I was on pills. I was really struggling. And throughout this whole time, we're trying to work on my disability. disability. I'm trying to get on disability. I finally quit my job. I'm 
kind of work through all of that. And I finally got into this program where they were considering doing a, a brain surgery on me. Oh, wow. To, like, this new thing, they weren't quite sure it would work. So they kept, like, seeing me after every few months of come and get my Botox. I'd get Botox shots into my neck. Okay. And into my back. And to see if that would work. And if it worked okay, they would um, consider doing the operation. And I really wanted the brain surgery. I thought, I, I kept, like, praying it would happen and then something could go wrong. And I could die being a fighter, and my parents would have no shame in that. I would mm. not be known as the gay kid. I'd be known as the, the, the guy who died trying to cure his disease. Wow. And that was just no longer sustainable. At, at a certain point, I had mourned. I had read books. I had learned. I had done nothing wrong to get this disability. Mm. And my pastor and my therapist really helped me get through that. Next came the hard part. I had to learn how to process my my gayness. Yeah. So you began processing your disability, probably Mm -hmm. even in the sense that, like, you were transitioning into a time of, like, I'm not going to work anymore. I'm going to have to be on disability, right? And you're also processing treatment options for that Mm -hmm. different doctors meeting with that. So that's constantly in your face in the sense of like, and it's obviously constantly something you're feeling and, and having to address. So I would assume that kind of initially got priority in counseling sessions and stuff. And now you're, as you've kind of handled that, you're realizing I now have to really do a deep dive into my sexuality and what that's, what effect that's having? As I came to terms with my disability, I, yeah, I was like, okay, now I have to do with this. And that is much harder. I, so what really opened me up to this was I watched this film by accident. Okay. Called, um, For the Bible Tells Me So. Okay. I thought it would be like how Christians over the century had twisted scripture to support things that were not right, like suppressing women or slavery. Sure. And the whole movie was about like gay Christians. Mm. And it really wrecked me. Like I remember after it finished, I sat there like with a smile for a bit, like, oh, God can love me this way. But, like, within that moment, like, no, that is a lie from Satan. You can't believe this. It's wrong. And it just really wrecked me. I immediately called my therapist, like, we need to meet, like, yesterday. We need to, I need to pass this. So talk about this. Now, is your therapist, by the way, just to get a context, is your therapist a Christian? Yes. Okay. Is your, is your therapist, like, part of a Christian therapy group in the sense that like are they she's getting her license i don't know what license or group she's a part of she's not approving but she's okay that's what i'm that's what she's educated and she knows enough so so she's not affirming but she's not pushing her own beliefs gotcha okay that's what i was that's what i was curious of okay okay um so still somewhat of a safe space but not necessarily an approving space right okay um and so you meet with her, I would assume, right after watching we, that movie yeah, and had, had that experience. It all, and I, I realized I need to take steps to address this. I need to start studying and really pursuing this and mm-hmm. finding out what I think. So I started like, listening to podcasts. I read books. I watched YouTube videos, like on all sides. Like I found non-approving people. I found approving people. And I just really started to pray over it and try to sit with it and try to think over it and really, like, ask God, what does he think of all of this? Like, yeah. And I kept, like, noticing how, how much more life there was in the approving side. Like, mm. people who had found kind of terms with them, with themselves, had so much more fruit and were just so much more of a blessing to people. Because, like, when you're, comp- like... When you're constantly oppressing who you are, you can't really move on or work. Yeah. 
Yeah. And yourself. Because you're always focusing on that one thing. For sure. And I don't know. I just found so many amazing testimonies and stories of people who knew what I was going through. Of people who admitted they lied when they said they had been healed. Mm. And... And then the approved, the non-approving people like... Hey friends, Doran wanted me to pop in here. He got a chance to listen back to the episode and at times he wanted to provide some clarity uh, for his story. And so he gave me some things to share with you along the way. So he just wanted me to pop in here and share some more details in his own words, but I will be uh, sharing them for you. Then came the non-approving people. I had been following their teachings all my life but it never brought me any life. I believe following Christ isn't always easy, but when there's a teaching in the church that consistently drives people to self-hatred, shame, and suicide, isn't that a good indication that there isn't much fruit in that teaching or that the fruit is bad? So you're processing this with your counselor and at what point, I mean, I obviously know you at some point within that process of, of you were still non-affirming when I met you, right? Or were you, were you just now approving, but I was very quiet about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you were, when, when did the process happen for you that you kind of, I guess, allowed yourself to be like, okay, you know what? I think, I think, God loves me, number one, but that God can bless me even as a gay Christian mm-hmm. being in a relationship. I I found two resources online. Uh, okay. Well, okay. I found Justin Lee's book, Torn. And Great book. I just really related to his story, and it yeah. just really, like, moved me. And then I found... Um, Rob and Linda's story yeah. online. And, um, Rob and Linda have been on the pod- podcast. Yes, they're yeah. amazing, beautiful people, and I love them so much. And I have uh, their story moved me, it, like pushed me in my faith to move forward, like mm-hmm. to trust God in this. Mm. And yeah, it's, just, and I don't know, like I found so much more peace within that like I kept like asking God are you sure like this is okay like I don't want to follow the devil I I want to serve you I want to be good yeah but I kept like getting reassurance and feelings of peace and I never had that peace before and yeah I think that says something yeah definitely so at what point at some point in there do you come out to your parents I asked my parents to come out and I had to meet with my past my therapist because I wanted them to be able to process with her if they needed to okay um, so they're they're coming out to central Pennsylvania yeah. to visit you just for like a day or two okay and I remember like having such anxiety like I don't know I, I never had this feeling again but like it felt like my heart kept like flushing like mm. It would happen like over and over. Like I'm not it could have been an anxiety attack. I really don't know. Sure. Um. So I just started bawling, and I said, "I really want you guys to love me and see me the way you always have, and just be proud of me." But I told them I'm gay, and they um, they were. This is not like a Christian horror story. Gay Christian horror story. Um, They were pretty, they were quiet. Um, They didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. They, I don't think it's a surprise, to be honest. They had both already asked you in suspicion to some extent, right? Yes, but I think the confirmation can always be surprising. Definitely. Um, I think after we left, the cancer, something, more things were said that were more hurtful and they had me come home again to see someone to be healed. Mm. The same pastor I had come out to before to be healed. They had me see him again to be healed again. And this time to, when they said to be healed, were they referencing to be healed of being gay? And they, and 
I'm not sure. I'm sure he could explain this a whole lot better than I'm about to, but he had me take this test before I even came out to determine how good of a Christian I was for this test. Okay. And, like, it dealt in extremes. Like, there are three bubbles, like, do you do this? Yes, sometimes, maybe. And then she said, do not say sometimes. So, I'm like, you're only working in extremes then. Like, yeah. there's no, like, sometimes. And, like, the questions were so bizarre. Like, do you get nervous in crowds? Are you scared of heights? And it's like, I don't understand how this makes me a good Christian. I mean, obviously, <laughs> there are some things that are like, but do you have sex? Do I'm you terrified this? of heights, so I must be a bad Christian. <laughs> there wow. are some questions in there about yeah. like being moral or whatever. Sure. But like, a lot of it I just did not understand. I, I come home. Over this time, my parents have told the whole family. I did not realize that until I came uh. home. Um... And it was just such an isolating time. Like, How many I, brothers and sisters do you have? Uh, two brothers, one sister. Okay. And, um, and so they've found out without you telling them. Right. At this point, right? Right. I, I, I don't think I explained to my parents that I wanted to do that myself. Sure. Anyway, so... Um, what happened? So really quick, really quick. Can, yeah. can we just flash back? You had said that your parents, this wasn't like a, you know, Christian coming out horror story because if you, if you're at all attached to this, worse stories yes, did that. exactly. If you're at all attached to this particular subject and topic, like you've maybe heard some pretty terrible experiences and stories that people have had regarding coming out to their parents. And that's, I would even say that beyond just the Christian bubble, but it can be hard for parents in a heteronormative world to find out that their child's gay Mm-hmm. Just in the masculine culture we live in, that can be a difficult thing for a father to process, for example. Um, but you're saying like, hey, it wasn't that bad. There was a therapist in the room, too. So you had done some 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 work um, previous to even prepare the atmosphere mm-hmm. to hopefully be more open. Um, but you had said once you had left, there were some things said that were hurtful. What What are some things that were said that were hurtful? And I mean, if you don't want to go into that, if you don't want to, you know, mm-hmm share some of what your parents said, but I'm just more curious what was, what was being said to you as you were like opening yourself up? You have all this anxiety. Um, Are you still pure? Okay. Um, I'll probably never accept this. Um, I kept like apologizing to them for being gay. Like Mm. I had like, you know, when you when you come to terms with yourself, you're not always there at that moment. So yeah. I was like, I'm sorry I'm gay. Like, I really don't want to be. I want you to be happy. And at one point, someone said, are you, are you really sorry? Mm. And I'm like, what do you do with that? Like, yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I really don't want to go too much I understand. into that. So, like, so... You go back home, you meet the faith healer again. The, my old pastor. Your old pastor. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Your old pastor. Oh, the pastor that you had originally come out right. to. Okay. And um, and he prays for you, maybe. Or, or it was a three-day thing. Where three I'd meet, days. I'd meet with him for a couple of hours. We'd talk over things. We'd okay. read scripture. We'd pray over things. And I'm going to put the best light on it that I can, I okay. think. I think God was there okay. in many ways. I, I remember hearing at, one, hearing at one point that God confirmed me again in my being a gay Christian man, hmm. but I did not tell them that. Yeah. Um, so that lasted three days. Three days. And, and when that ended, what happened? So mom and dad sat down with me to ask me how it went. I said, I still think... I, I, I said, I, I'm gay. Like, yeah. nothing changed. I'm sorry. This didn't work out for you. I didn't want this for my life, but this is how it is. And I think God can bless me. Hmm. And it... Hmm, I don't know. A lot of stuff was said. And I remember at one point just walking up and... 
I remember at one point standing up and just walking away. Like, there's no point in even discussing. Nothing I was said was being taken in. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of gave up. And it's just so painful to be in that situation. I, I knew that was a possibility, but I had hoped that they would at least, like, really examine scripture or really examine the stories I had tried to share with them. But, you know, that's just not how it went. Yeah. So do you go back home then after that? You go back to Harrisburg? Uh, yeah, I went back to Harrisburg. Um, yeah, back to back to your job, back to or back to back to I'm, back to the reality that you're you're not working at this point. So back to life as normal. And what what's the next process for you? Are you now you're still not accepting of yourself yet, right? I I'm more accepting than I had been. Okay, I, I had went to some friends and told them what happened, and they confronted me. They said, "Dorn, you need to stop apologizing for something you cannot control." Mm. And from that moment on. To the best of my ability, I told myself I would never apologize for being gay again. Okay. Um, honestly, from, from then on, it's just been life and me figuring things out. I'm more assured of my salvation than I ever have been. Okay. I'm more at peace. And after I came out to my parents and actually, like, came to terms with my sexuality, my, my dystonia really, really calmed down. Really? I used to be so much worse, like, hunched over, but, like, I th- granted, with quitting work and with coming to terms with myself, like, yeah, I had seen so many blessings come through that. Sure, sure. And in that process, would you say where you are now is you are affirming? Oh, I'm absolutely affirming. Okay. Yeah. Affirming, would you say you're seeking a relationship, would be open to absolutely. a relationship? I, I see so much more life in people who are affirming of themselves. Um, okay. I see so much more, I'm not sure the proper wordage, I see just so much more fruit and yeah. Things I think God went to see in someone's life. Yeah. Would you say you came to the conclusion of affirmation in part because of like going to conferences like GCN, which is now Q? Like, when was your first conference that you went to? Uh, it's like uh, Pittsburgh. Um, I think I was affirming before that, but that was the first time I had actually been around other gay Christians in mass. Like, I had okay. done some other gay Christians locally yeah, who yeah, I yeah. connected with, but like, I cannot even begin to describe how how much the Holy Spirit really worked and how how present he really felt yeah. there. Like amongst other gay Christians. It's just amazing. That's um, awesome. And so that just probably furthermore encouraged you because you were like, Oh, there's other absolutely. people out here that and are similar to There were similar there to were me. parents there who gave free mom and free dad hugs and that I think that was probably the most after I came back from conference, that, that always brought me to tears, thinking of the, the parents who would like, go every year just to give hugs mm. and to be a present to people who, whose parents aren't embracing their kids. Mm. Mm. So now, um, what, what would you say from your journey, like, if you had to give advice to someone who's maybe listening to this, that, let, let's start here. Someone's listening to this who's in a position of parenting, leadership, responsibility over somebody, like maybe it's a pastor, maybe it's a a parent, maybe it's just a community leader listening to this, and they're not gay, but maybe they're walk journeying with somebody who's coming to that conclusion, has come to that conclusion. Um, What's some advice you have for them? If you're a parent, talk to other parents of gay kids. Um... Find that community around you. Don't be scared to ask questions. Find resources. There are so many resources now for gay Christians. Um, yeah, keep seeking, keep praying. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's good. That's good. Now, what if um, 
someone's listening to this who is uh, gay, they've come to that realization about themselves, part of the LGBT community in general, um, what would be your advice to them as they're processing that and figuring out maybe they're dealing with some of the same stuff you dealt with? Like if you could speak to Doran at 14, what advice would you give yourself? I maybe Doran good... at 14 would listen to me. Oh, that's a good answer. So you don't think Doran at 14 would be even be I open enough to hear? I think so scared to even address this issue at that point. Okay. Extra thoughts from Doran here. Here's what he says. I would say, don't be scared. There are so many people out there who are waiting to love you. The journey you've been on might have really sucked and it might get a bit harder here and there, but believe me when I say it gets better. You are on the brink of discovering so many new things about God and yourself. Keep seeking and talking to God. You're also an artist. We should plug your art. So if people want to uh, like see your artwork, real quick before that, yeah, I I want to talk about my parents a bit more. Okay, yeah, let's do that. My parents are amazing people. Like, the more I, I grow up, the more I'm amazed at what they've done. They took me to an, another school that was the rival for my education. Like they sacrificed a lot, and even though we're not in agreement right now, they. I still want everyone to like know how much I love and respect them. Yeah. They're, Do you sense that your parents might come around? No. No. I have no hope of that. Okay. No. What will happen when you are in a relationship and it comes to the holidays and traveling home or do you travel home for holidays? Still? I do. Um, I really don't know. I've been told things will change, but I don't know what that means. Hmm. But on my, on my account, I still love and appreciate them. And they, yeah, they've shown a lot of, they've done the most they can in this situation. Me popping in here again with some more words from Doran. I do my best to remind myself how they were raised, how they were taught to view the world. And that helps. My parents are beautiful, caring people and I love them deeply. I've had so many hardships in my story, but they've always been there when I need them. I know they love me, and I love them. Well, I think that's a gracious response, and I've found that I think the more gracious we can be with one another, especially people who maybe are struggling to process a new idea Mm -hmm. or a new way of seeing things, the more open they tend to be toward changing their view. No. Um, so I'll be praying for that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, back your to, art. Back to the art. You um, are an artist. So like four, five years ago, I'm not quite sure when, I, being disabled, you have a lot of time in your hands, and I always enjoyed artwork. So I've been really diving into artwork. Recently, I found a great, art scanner so I've been like I feel okay selling my work now so usually I, I just keep all the art in my closet somewhere yeah. but yeah I've been selling artwork now so if people want to buy your artwork or see your artwork they can go to your Instagram or where's the best place to go to buy your artwork um, or to get connected with you there's a website called aspie.com it's uh, a website made for people with disabilities who are selling artwork the aspie yeah, A S P I E A R T I S T S dot com. So Aspie Art Artsy. A- artists. Aspie Artists. Okay, awesome. All right, and we'll put a link in the show notes. So yeah. people who are listening to this, if you just go into the show notes, whether you're on iTunes or Spotify or, or whatever. Or you can contact me directly on my Instagram. What's your Instagram? Uh, Dorn Gingrich. D O R R I N. G-I-N-G-E-R-I-C-H. Great. Awesome. So they can connect with you on Instagram. They should give you a follow anyways, right? Just to follow you and see what you're up to. Follow me. I'm fun. (laughs) And then uh, also, um, you post your artwork on your Instagram too, so they can see your artwork. And I have a Facebook group, so you can find that on Instagram too. Awesome. Very cool. Doran, thank you for being on Beyond Boundaries. Thank you.